All right, welcome to another edition of the Steve Lags Unfiltered Podcast. I have a truly amazing, badass woman with me today. This is an author. This is a, a wonderful mother, an amazing wife, and also the CEO of one of the top veteran organizations in the world. I've got Ryan Mannion here today. Let's get going. Hold on to your seats. You're watching Steve Lags Unfiltered. And now, meet your host, Steve Lags. Hey, Ryan, how you doing today? Good. I'm happy to be here. I'm super excited to have you here. So, Ryan, you're CEO of Travis Mannion Foundation and so much more. You're, uh, you, you have a podcast. You, you wrote a book. You're an awesome family person. You know, we first met uh, a few years ago when we were working in Doylestown. We were looking for a local uh, organization and we stumble across, I learned about the Travis Mannion Foundation, which was in Doylestown where our headquarters is. And little did I know our uh, our children were going to school together at yeah. that time. <laughs> so yeah, tell me a little bit about the Travis Mannion Foundation for our viewers and listeners and you know what that organization does, because it really does an amazing job of impacting, not only empowering veterans and their families, but also impacting the community in general. Yeah, so um, I'll kind of, bring it back a little bit to the beginning. Yeah. Um, my brother, uh, First Lieutenant Travis Mannion, he was a uh, on his second deployment in Iraq and uh, with the United States Marine Corps, um, was killed on that deployment. And, you know, for us as a family, we had to decide what the future looked like. And, and I'll never forget, and I often share this story, it was the day of Travis's funeral, my dad pulled my mom and I into their bedroom mm -hmm. and he said, you know, I don't know what happens after today, but I know that no matter what, we live a life worthy of Travis's sacrifice. Right. And so that can mean a lot of different things. Um, for my mom, that meant starting the Travis Mannion Foundation. And so, you know, people will, will constantly say, oh, you founded the Travis Mannion Foundation. I had nothing to do with it at the beginning. Okay. In fact, I saw it as a labor of love for a grieving mother who had lost her only son. Mm -hmm. And I thought what she was doing was amazing. I also thought it would be a small little memorial fund in the Doylestown or greater Philadelphia area. Right. And I always say that my dad and I jumped on the bandwagon when we saw like she was doing big things, and finally, I was like, I want to be a part of this, and so. So what? Like so, walk at that time. You decide you want to be a part of that. Like, wh how does that? How do you come to that realization? Like, is it was what was it that really made you decide that was? Was it simply because you saw something bigger, or it was just taking off? Like, and you're leaving a a, a career to do this, right? Yeah. So at the time, so I. Um, when my brother was killed, I was a small business owner. I owned two clothing boutiques in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And um, and I left doing that. And I was very successful. Mm -hmm. But I left that probably about eight months. I sold both of my businesses, realizing that it, it just didn't bring me purpose. Okay. And I needed something more. So I thought, oh, I'm going to go work for the government. Because okay. I thought, oh, government work, that'll bring me purpose. <laughs> I realized very quickly okay. it didn't. <laughs> um, and so I was working for HUD. Um, and my mom at the time had actually advertised for, I would meet my mom for lunch. I would clock out for lunch. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in true government fashion, literally clock in, clock out. Right. I had 37 minutes to eat lunch. And I'd meet my mom at the the TG, uh, the TG Smith's, I forget, right in Doylestown. Okay. And I'd sit down with her, and she'd tell me all the things that she was doing. And every day, I would just be excited about the impact that she was having and and the things that she was working on to positively impact the military community. And so she ended up telling me one day at lunch, you know, I need an executive director. Like, mm -hmm. we're, getting, we're getting too big. And so um, I actually went on. And sent my resume in to <laughs> careers at travismanion.com. Awesome. Like I was, and and I always say there was clearly no nepotism involved, but Great. I did get the job. Um, obviously, there was a lot of nepotism involved, but um, <laughs> but I got the job, and so I was working alongside my mom. And right away from the first day that I started working there, 
I was like, this is it. This is what I'm supposed to be doing with the rest of my life. What does it feel like when you, because so many people struggle finding their purpose in life. Yeah. Like I know, and I know you found it. Like you're such a great example of that. And so you, so it, you know, you, you align your work with what you, what your purpose is. Tell everybody how amazing that is and how that really changes like your life and really helps you move through things and challenges and everything. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, you know, listen, I wish this wasn't my life's purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, I wish that I was still selling designer jeans and um, Uncle Travis was coming over to play with my kids on the weekend. Right. You know, I think I'd I'd still be fulfilled as an in, fulfilled as an individual, but um, but that's not the case. Right. And so um, I feel so blessed that I have the opportunity to wake up every day and do something that brings me so much purpose. Right. You know, I'm honoring my brother mm -hmm. um, and I'm giving back to others in his name. Right. Now, I'm also very aware that not everybody has that uh, opportunity. Right. And so I always say to people like, you may not find your purpose in your day job. Mm -hmm. That may not be a thing. And that's okay. Yes. You don't have, everybody doesn't have to wake up every day and go to their day job and say, I am, I am purposeful. You may just have a good job that puts food on the table for your family right. and that's it. Mm -hmm. But you have to find something that takes the place of that. Right. You have to find something in your life that brings you fulfillment and meaning and being a part of something more. Right. And so if that's not happening in your day job. Don't feel like, you know, I think people automatically think, well, then this isn't the right place for me. Right. You know, if you have a good job mm -hmm. and you're doing well and you work with great people, it doesn't have to bring some higher purpose. Right. But find something else that does. Right. And so I always, that's always my elevator pitch when I'm talking to people. I'm like, you can become a part of the Travis Manion Foundation. <laughs> yes. We have a lot of opportunities outside of work and on the weekends. But there are things like that that you can do yes. to find that higher purpose. That's right. Yeah, like volunteering your time, and, yeah. right? And or aligning the work, the results of your work with other things that you want in life that would be more purposeful. Sure. Like for instance, if you make money at work and you have more than you need, then send it to a good organization. <laughs> that's that's uh listen, you know, and I'll, I'll tell you Steve, I, I never forget you, you know, you sent in a very sizable donation to the Travis Manning Foundation and it came in and, you know, a lot of times when we get checks at that level, we kind of know they're coming. They're mm -hmm. not just, just, they don't just show up in the mailbox. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, my major gifts officer was like, this person lives in Doylestown. Who are they? <laughs> and I'm like, wait, his kids are in my kid's class. And I remember having that first conversation with you and saying to you, like, what do you know about the Travis Manning Foundation? Like, you know, this is an incredible gift that you've given to us. And, and you were just so kind by saying like, listen, I, I, like you said, like I had, I had more than I needed for the business this year. I wanted to give it somewhere. I looked up what you guys did and, yeah. and I wanted to give it back. And, right. and, um, you know, I think that's a lot of what the, makes the world go round. You know, we have to find things that, are bigger than ourselves yes. to be attached to, to be a part of, you yeah. know? And yeah, I think that that's just so important to really be happy in life is find what that is for for yourself. Um, but and it's but think about you took a, like a, a, something that was a, a tragedy for mm -hmm. your family and turned it into something so good and, and so impactful. So uh, how does the Travis Man Manion Foundation, how they helping veterans, their families, and also impacting the community? Sure. So we like to say that the Travis Manning Foundation is a community. Okay. Um, we are a community of veterans, families of fallen service members, and inspired civilians. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our main goal is to make sure that we are impacting communities across the country. And one of the things we do is make sure that veterans know that when they take the uniform off, our nation still needs them to serve. Yes. And so we give them continued ways to serve their communities right. outside of uniform. That does a lot of things. You know, a lot of people say like, oh, it's so great. Veterans are doing all these different things through TMF in communities. And I'm like, and it is. I mean, we have had, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about our, our, our biggest, our flagship program. But- more than the impact that's happening in communities across the country from veterans, what's more important to us is that the veteran mental health epidemic is abysmal right now. Okay. We're in a bad place. Yeah. And um, a lot of times we're looking to 
help people when they've already passed the point of no return. Right. You know, where it becomes, okay, it's a critical um, situation. We like to look at veterans and say, how can you come into our organization at a five? Right. We want to, we want to get you to a one. We don't want you going to a 10. Right. We don't want you going over that edge. And the biggest way and the easiest way to do that is to give them a sense of purpose yes, again. Right. I mean, it is literally that simple. Yeah. Make them feel a part of something bigger than themselves. Right. And so our flagship program at the Travis Manning Foundation is called Character Does Matter. Mm -hmm. And we actually train veterans to deliver character education to our youth. Uh, we have over 3,000 veterans that have gone through the training, and we've delivered the program to over half a million kids across the country. Wow. Yeah. And so, you know, when you think about what it means to serve in the military, there are a lot of intangible qualities that our servicemen and women have that civilians don't. Right. You know, when you when you enter into the workforce as a civilian, you may enter into a company that has a great mission that has set values that talks about things like leadership. I mean, clearly if you work at TRC, that's happening here. I see what you right. do. Like you're talking about those principles. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, that's not something you're being taught. You're not going into the workforce and being taught about what service means, what leadership means. Right. These are all things when you join the military that is a part of your training. Right. And so men and women take off the uniform and they have all these intangible skill sets right. that the average person doesn't. Yes. And so for us, it was like, how awesome would it be to pass that on to the next generation? Yeah. And so um, that's what we do. So when they uh, when they speak in front of these children, what age groups is it? Is it, is it vary? Is it like older children in high school, middle school? So, you know, the we are in like the 12 to 20 range is kind of the sweet spot. Okay. You know, junior high, high school. Um, but we do, um, we have curriculum for younger kids. Right. Um, in fact, we're working on even more robust curriculum for that K through five group. Right. Um, because it's never too early to, you know, start talking to kids about, yeah. you know, making the right decisions, yes. you know? Right. Yeah. That's incredible because if you want to really impact people, you want to start, start at, at the at younger age. Well, and I'll never forget, it was very early on in the, the inception of this program. I was talking to a high school principal and we had a fantastic veteran get, go in and he gave a student wide assembly. Mm -hmm. um, and what they do is, you know, we'll talk about things like, Again, leadership, integrity, courage, moral courage, humility, all, you know, all of all sorts of different um, attributes. And um, after the presentation, she said, you know, this is so and it was at a um, it was at an elite private school mm -hmm. um, that we were at out in, in Philadelphia area. And she said, this is so impactful, she said, because, you know, I have a lot of kids here that are straight-A students, they're all-star athletes, and she said, and they're assholes. Oh, okay, yeah. And she said, and they graduate from the school, and they go to college, and they're the captains of the football team, mm -hmm. and they're assholes. Yeah. And then they graduate from college, and they go into the workforce, and they're assholes. <laughs> and it's like, if we're not talking to kids, I would much rather my kid be knowledgeable in what it means to be a good leader Yes. than what, you know, how to write in cursive, yes, right? Like, yeah. let's actually teach kids what they need to know to be good people right. when they go into and enter the world as individuals, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. I love you. It's so good. It's so true, too, because if we're not teaching them how to be amazing people, but have impact to lead themselves, what that looks like, you know, to have great values, and and to be a great example for other people, because you can see, you can go to, you graduate from school, the smartest people that graduate, not are, not always are going to be the most ha uh, successful yes. and happiest people, because they they don't have the values, they don't have the character attributes, they're not, everything was easy for them, they were told how great they were all the time, they didn't have humility, they're not coachable and trainable. And they get into they, they're older and they really struggle. Yeah, and they're not really making an impact because they're self serving and they're not out to help other people. Yeah, and uh, you know I look for that in leadership uh, attributes. I, if someone wants to be a leader in my organization, I'm always looking to are they looking to serve other people? Right. Like are they do they want to lead because it because it, it fulfills them when they help other people succeed, or is it just I want all the benefits that come along with being a leadership in leadership because being a leader 
is not uh, is challenging and you're leading uh, an, an organization. I'm sure you're challenged all the time. Yeah. I mean, listen, you know, I, I deal with the same struggles that anybody leading a, a business deals with. Right. But like one of the things for us is we are at, at TMF, we really focus on the values, right. our values at TMF. And right. like, I always say, I am much more about the intangible skill sets. Like, is this person a good cultural fit? Right. I don't need them to have a PhD in psychology to be part of our training curriculum team. I need them to be a good person right. who's invested in our mission and wants to do the right thing. Right. And we can teach them the rest, you right. know? So that's so interesting because we also make sure everyone's a core value fit in our culture. Yeah. How do you determine that? Um, through a series of many, many interviews, okay. um, I think it is a, it's an arduous process right. to get hired at the Travis Manning Foundation. Okay. You go through many iterations yes. of, um, and you know, and I think we've done a really good job. Our director of people is fantastic and really framing out questions to understand, um, you know, where, how these people will fit within our organization before we even start having conversations about the actual job itself. So is it fair to say you have a disciplined process? You follow? We do have a very disciplined process. Right. Yeah. So, um, except when I come in and say, oh, hey, <laughs> so-and-so's cousin called me and, and his nephew applied for the job. And he's like, you know, and I, I always disrupt the system. You know? <laughs> well, I'm never trying to put anybody in, but you know. Yeah. Um, but when you know, you know. Yeah. Right. For sure. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So yeah, we have a disappoint. We have family members in our business and they apply just like anyone else. Yeah. Right. But we have a, a, my niece is working here. She applied just like everyone else. And I totally stayed out of it. I made sure I stayed out of it. Yeah. You have to, you <laughs> right. have to. Um, so w what is the phrase? Yeah. Uh, if not me, then who means to you? So if not me, then who those are, that is really our, our mantra at the Travis Manning foundation. Those are the five words that, we live by. Right. They're the five words we try to make sure that everybody that comes into contact with TMF lives by. It's what we talk to kids about, about, you know, if not me, then who being big in the little moments. Um, but those five words originated, actually, they were spoken by my brother. Right. Um, he was home uh, in between his first and second deployment to Iraq. Uh, just had a small window of time. He was stationed in um, San Diego, Pendleton. Mm -hmm. And he came back to the Philadelphia area and, um, you know, to visit with family, friends, and we were diehard Eagles fans, season ticket holders, and he's like, got to go to an Eagles game. <laughs> so um, went to the Eagles game, and he was leaving the game. He was with my husband, and as they were leaving, um, my husband jokingly said to him as they were walking down the stairs, why don't you let me push you down the stairs? Maybe you'll break your ankle, <sighs> and you won't have to go back to Iraq. Right. And he said, my my brother, who was like super lighthearted the whole night, like having a great time, got real serious. Mm. And he looked at Dave and he said, you know what? Um, if I don't go back to Iraq, then somebody much less prepared is going to go in my in my place. Right. If not me, then who? Right. And so, you know, my husband came home that night and he shares the story and he's like, God, I feel like such a jerk. Uh. I literally told my bro your brother I wanted to push him down the stairs. And this is this was his answer. Right. And so, you know, what we realized is that that was the first time we heard him say those five words. Mm -hmm. But if you look over the course of his life, that those were the five words that he lived by. Like yes. I can I can think back to things that happened when we were young where he was demonstrating what it meant to live by those five words. Right. So um they've really just become the rallying cry for us on, you know, what it means to like take something and apply it and just be again, be bigger than yourself, you right. know? That's amazing. So again, you just take something that was really, you know, really horribly unfortunate and you've you've converted it into something so positive. Yeah. So, you know, his sacrifice is not wasted. I mean, he was already serving our country, but you made it so much, uh, so much more impactful than it, than it would have ordinarily been. You know, I was on the website and you can just see, uh, there's a section with all the um, all the veterans that lost their lives, right? And it's interesting because we hear in the news a number, 
And until you like look at the, you just start with a picture of a real person and then hear the story of the real people, it becomes so much more impactful than in the news. It's just the number, oh, five people and you, and you, they're well, real people. It's so funny you bring this up because I was literally recording an episode yesterday of, of my podcast and, um, and I was sharing a story that after Travis died, there was a, um, there was a business in town. Uh, in Doylestown, mm -hmm. and um, they had, you know, this is during the height of the Iraq war, and they had um, a tally. Mm -hmm. So every time a service member was killed, um, it was a civic, one of the civic buildings in town, they would change the number. Yeah. And I remember it bothered Travis so much, so mm -hmm. much so that when he was home, he said, you know, that's like, that's crazy, you know, they're just putting numbers up there, right? Like, put their names, yes. you know? And so after he died, it was a few days later, I was driving through Doylestown right in the center of town and I saw they had changed the number. And, you know, that huh. next number there, that was Travis's. And listen, I'm in a, I'm in a, in, in the beginning, when you deal with a sudden tragedy, it's, you know, you do things outside of what you would normally do. And I stormed in and this poor lady behind the counter, I laid into her yeah. like no other you know, telling her, you know, my brother's not a number, you know, put his name and, and they ended up taking it down completely. Um, but that's what I always say, like these men and women who have given their lives in service to our country, like they're not numbers, that's right. they're names, right. they're, they have families, they have friends, they have children, they have siblings, they have parents, like they're you and I, right. you know? And so it's so <clears throat> important for us to understand the stories of these brave men and women who serve and sacrifice for us, yes. you know? Yeah, I think people would care a lot more and appreciate the sacrifice a lot more when they understand the real people and the families that are supporting them. Yeah, I, I uh, my, my challenge every Memorial Day, I kind of give the same rally cry is, you know, because there, there are some that say like Memorial Day is a somber day. You need to, you know, and and I don't actually, I don't actually agree with that notion. Right. Um, I actually think, you know, when my brother was here on Memorial Day, we were down at the beach. Mm -hmm. We were hanging out. Mm -hmm. We were doing everything that the typical people do on Memorial Day. Yes. Barbecue, beach, pool, whatever it may be, celebrating the beginning of summer. But so do all those things. Mm -hmm. But take some time that weekend to learn the story of a fallen service member. Right. Just learn one story and learn that story. And as you're sitting on the beach with your buddy, drinking a cold beer, yes. tell their story to a friend. Yes. Pass that story on, you know? And so as simple as that, like on Memorial Day, share those stories, share those stories of those men and women. I need to do that. I'm going to do that. Yeah. And, and people are like, well, how do I do that? I'm like, oh. literally Google <laughs> fallen service members. Yeah. You know, you could say fallen service members, World War One, fallen service members, World War Two, Korean War, Vietnam War, you know, I Iraq, Afghanistan. It, you, it is so easy, That's you know, right. and just learn one story. That's amazing. Uh, I'm going to definitely do that. You know, you, I was I put some notes here. The Resilient Life podcast, what I love the way you start your podcast, you say every human will struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge is to struggle well. Yeah. I love that. So tell, talk a little bit about that. Well, I think, you know, I like to talk about the idea of struggling well because um, I didn't necessarily struggle well. Mm -hmm. um, in the wake of losing Travis, you know, um, it was the toughest thing I ever dealt with. Um, three years after Travis was killed, his best friend um, and roommate at the Naval Academy, um, Brendan Looney, who was a Navy SEAL, was killed in Afghanistan. Mm. So um, that was a crushing blow to my family. And then um, just a year after that, my mom died of cancer. Oh. And so in the course of five years, I had lost my brother, his best friend, my mom, and my mom's mom, my grandmother, uh, died the same day my mom did. Oh, um, wow. And so it was a rough five years. And I felt like I was moving okay after Travis's loss, but it was that, and I pushed everything off, right? Mm. I just kept busy. Right. Like my goal after Travis's loss was just to keep really busy. And it worked until it didn't. Because after my mom died, that was just like, 
that just set me back. Mm -hmm. And I went into a really dark place. I suffered from anxiety, depression. I didn't know how to go forward. And so I became very intentional mm -hmm. about taking the power back. Right. Like I am not going to let my struggles define me. Right. And so, you know, over the course of that, and that involved therapy, mm -hmm. that involved being very intentional about where I was and what things I needed to do for myself um, mentally and physically. And so I, I say it was about, you know, six months post my mom dying where I became very intentional about, again, like taking the power back, you know, right. because I was actually suffering with like debilitating anxiety, yes. like not leave my house anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so I started getting better. I started right. coming out of it. And, you know, people would say there was, wasn't like I was very open about it at the time, mm -hmm. but there was a few people that kind of knew what I was dealing with. And, and they would say, you know, how are you doing? And I didn't want to say good because the people around me knew that I wasn't necessarily doing good, right. but it wasn't like doing bad, uh -huh. right? I was like, I wasn't in a good place, but I was working to find my way out of it. So, and then I started to think like, all right, I'm struggling, but I'm struggling well, I like right? That. Like yeah. I'm intentional about like, I'm not in the best place, but I'm committed right. to finding my way out of it. Right. And it's not the last time that I've had to struggle well. <laughs> like my life ebbs and flows daily, you right. know, but it's also about being cognizant <clears throat> that our life does ebb and flow. And so when we're in those dips and those down moments, like we have to kind of put that armor on to say, okay, this like this isn't my time, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm going through some stuff, but I'm going to get through it. I'm going to be strong and I'm going to struggle in the right way. Right. You know? So it's like, you got to make a choice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can struggle poorly and, and just, just be stuck there. You can just struggle. You can just play an old struggle right. and feel sorry for yourself and not make the decisions you need to make to, to do things, to get yourself where you need to be. You and know? it's almost like you don't play the victim there. It's like, okay, hey, I got control over this. I can change this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I love that struggle well. Yeah. And that's more, that's a lot. You're being transparent, but you're being honest, but you're not finding a way to be like, oh, I'm, I, it sucks. Yeah. But there's a positive spin to it. Like, hey, yeah, I'm, I, I'm struggling right now, but I'm struggling well. Yeah. Um, You know, wh what is leading this organization? What is mo one of the most important lessons that you've learned? Hmm. I love asking people this question. I think... Hmm, that's a good question. I think for me, you know, one of the things we started off um, the Travis Manning Foundation at the beginning again, you know, it was my mom, mm -hmm. it was my dad, it was my aunt. It was a family affair, right? right. Our first employee was my best friend mm -hmm. um, who still works there to this day. Um, she just celebrated her 15 year anniversary. Excellent. Um, our director of special events. But, um, you know, she was sitting around at my mom's kitchen table. Um, and my mom bought her a laptop and paid her $10 an hour. Like mm -hmm. that was the beginning of the Travis Manning Foundation. And, you know, here we are today, we've got over 80 employees across the country. And I have had to learn that, you know, not everybody, and it's been, I've had to learn it and I've also so greatly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to sit around at a table and we'd make these decisions and it was almost kind of this group thing. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, this is what we're doing. Right. And I have such an incredibly diverse group of individuals now that bring such great ideas and um, different thoughts uh, that, that very much differ from me. So it's starting to appreciate and understand kind of the diversity of thought around right. running an organization and the people that help you grow it, you right. know? Yes. Yeah. Because it takes a lot of creativity to do what you're doing. Here. Yeah. I mean, you're doing, a, you're, you're doing, you got training programs, you've got events, you're, you, you need to raise, uh, you need to raise money. Yeah. Oh, so how, how can people, how can we help the Travis Mannion Foundation? How can we help you and this organization? Like what are different ways that we can, as a community help? I mean, there's so many different ways. Like I said, you know, we are a veteran service organization first and foremost, but 50% of our community is made up by inspired civilians. Right. So there are, we've got 30 chapters across the country. Mm -hmm. um, there's 
plenty of ways to volunteer, right. to become a, a volunteer. If you're into, um, you know, the physical uh, aspect of things, we have a ton of different athletic events. Mm-hmm. One of them being the 9-11 Heroes Run. We execute over 60 5K races in the month of September across the country. Um, so you can get out and run a 5K race. How many of them do you actually attend? I mean, is 60 is only, what, 30 days in the month? Yes. Um, I normally get to like four or five of them. I go okay. to some of our, you know, in Houston, we have a race with over 5,000 people. Wow. Um, Philadelphia is a big race. Annapolis is a big race. Charleston, South Carolina. These are some of our real big races. And in fact, Doylestown is one of our top races too. Yes. Um, we have a big race in Doylestown. Um, but, um, and then, you know, there is merely just uh, donating, right? right? You can go to our website, yes. travismanion.org and, um, and help us that way as well. Um, so we, and if you're a veteran, and you're and you're a veteran. Like, wow, this is interesting, and that program sounds interesting. I want to work on, you know, being able to find better purpose. You know, transitioning out of the military. What is a veteran? How does a veteran find? Is it just simply go to the website? Like, how do they do? They call you? Like, what does that look so like? So, a veteran. Uh, you know, if, if you're a veteran listening to this right now, and you want to get involved in the Travis Manning Foundation, go to our website and click join the mission. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. And then your regional team will be connected with you Mm -hmm. and within 48 hours and tell you about all the different opportunities that exist um, in your area. And like any veteran can like, there'll be an opportunity for almost every, any veteran. Is it like, is there a process there? Like, how does that work? So there's so many different things. Like, again, I kind of talked about our flagship character program. There are so many different things and ways for veterans to get involved. That okay. that's just kind of like the the top of the pyramid, okay. right? Um, so yeah, there's there's a ton of different ways that veterans can play a part in TMF. And if you're if you're a civilian, we're not in the military. It's funny you're using the, like military term civilian. Like, what do you think one of the most patriotic things that we can if we're not serving in the military and we want to support our country? Uh, and be patriotic. What, what what can we do? Like what what do you like when you look at? Because I think there's uh, an underappreciation for what our military does for our country. Yeah, and uh, and there's not enough support for it. And we take a lot for granted. I believe our freedoms that we that so many gave so much for. They gave it all. Like how can we be a patriot? Like what can we do to to support the military and just this country and our freedoms? You know. I don't think it's some big thing. I think it is just small, simple things. Like, again, understanding and not taking for granted these freedoms that we hold so dear. Right. And and being vocal about it and talking about it. You know, in the last month, we have lost 12 service members to Mm -hmm. training accidents. Just Just training? Just training. Wow. Two weeks ago, there were five Marines that were killed in a a helicopter crash, you know? Um, uh, two SEALs um, were killed. Mm-hmm. Um, there were three National Guardsmen. Um, things like this happen each and every day. Right. There are men and women that are deployed across the world. Mm-hmm. You know, when it, it, it's very hard for us, or I should say easy for us, to forget that when we're no longer a nation at war— and, you know, you almost become desensitized to it over the last 20 years— Yes. —that there are men and women out there— all over the world, you know, protecting and defending our freedoms mm-hmm. that we hold. And so I think it's having that deeper appreciation. And and it's simple things like on Memorial Day, yes. telling that story. If you're a business owner and, you know, Veterans Day is coming up, do something, even if it is just inside, internal to your company, by just saying, hey, it's Veterans Day today and, you know, we're going to bring a veteran in right. or we're going to tell the story of a veteran, making sure that your people know how important it is to you. Yes. You know, I, I think it's just that general awareness. I know that's something that bothered me a lot, that people didn't have this understanding of what our men and women were doing over there. And, you know, there was this, this famous picture um, during the height of the Iraq war. And um, it said something like, you know, I, somebody had drawn it on a, a wall in Iraq and it got pushed around and I'm going to, mess it up, but it said something like, you know, we're out here fighting and the rest of America's at the mall. Right. Like they don't get it. Right. You know? And like, I think it's just about, just get it. Just understand. Yeah. You know, don't take it for granted and don't try to just, you know, there's less than 1% of men and women that serve this country, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. 
And so if you have kids, talk to your kids. Right. Talk to your kids about what military service means. Mm -hmm. Have them understand that that potentially is a path, you know? Right. Um, so I just, I think it's about general awareness. Yeah, definitely increasing awareness. Right, and also social media. How do we follow you on social media? How do we connect with you there? Uh, you can follow me everywhere. I'm probably most active on Instagram, but right. Armanian uh, on Instagram, Armanian on Twitter, and Ryan Mannion on Facebook. All right, awesome. Ryan, you're amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Isn't she amazing? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll make sure travismannion.org. You got it. And let's make sure we show uh, Ryan some incredible support. Thanks, Steve. Thank you so much. That's all for today's Steve Legg's Unfiltered Journey. Keep soaring, leading, and conquering with us. Remember, it's not just about listening. It's about learning and taking action. If today ignited your drive, join us next time for more unfiltered wisdom. Subscribe, rate, and leave a review to fuel your success journey. Also, be sure to listen to us on your favorite podcast channel or outlet. Stay tuned, stay unfiltered, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Boom.